welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the heroic fantasy RPG known as Aether, and another one I can add to the Card Hall of Fame, fame, be fame being a work in progress, the one, some, some, know, some know him as the Eldritch Crow, some know him, some know him as Eric Desiver, but we, but we know him as... The next guest here in the temple. Hey, how, how you doing today, man? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a very, uh, it's been a very social media heavy week. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's well, good. Good is good. I, <laughs> I do, I do apologies in advance if you hear if you hear the screaming if you hear screaming sounds from Lions fans across the river. Or across the lake, I, so, I should say. I mean, are are they going to be weeping as usual? Because from what I hear, that tends to be the trend for Lions fans. Oh, there's there's a scene in Kentucky Fried Movie that I that I always use as a running gag when dealing with any team out of Detroit. The whole thing of take him of this of this villain going take take him to Detroit and the. The guy opposite of him is like, no, no, anything but anything but Detroit, anything but that. As as someone who uh, lives in the Canadian town, affectionately known, affectionately nicknamed South Detroit, because we are south of Detroit based mm -hmm. on geography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's a whole thing. Um, if any Canadians in the audience suddenly know where I live, uh. Donate to my Kickstarter to pity, <laughs> but <laughs> I'd like to open as I often do with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what about it made it stick. Oh, um, so this was a weird kind of combination of things of timing and a lack of creative outlets. So, what happened was I had just graduated um, my undergrad in creative writing. And then I was applying for a master's, different university, uh, but a master's in creative writing, and I didn't get in. Um, so I had a span of about two years with like kind of twiddling my thumbs, trying to figure out what to do with myself until I got into a master's program. And for a while there, like I was kind of down and out. And that's when I got into watching Critical Role. You know, as a lot of people do. Um, but it snagged me because I actually hadn't been introduced to TTRPGs or D&D or anything like that beforehand. I was actually strictly a video games person. And then, you know, coming from a creative writing background, I, because I was feeling down and out, I wasn't doing much writing at the time. So I was sort of just scrambling for ways to get my brain to work and just wound up latching on to CR, and then I latched on to D&D really hard, and then I found a group online, and we've been playing for four years now, ever since, which mm -hmm. is shocking considering all the horror stories about, you know, online gaming groups. Now that I've, I've, le I've learned for the longest time that the, that, um, Focusing focusing on the horror stories is kind of, is kind of like focusing only on the only on the bad ga bad games in the video game end of things. Oh. Yeah, exactly. But like when you're just getting started and you're going into like uh, looking for game posts, the horror stories are the ones that always get brought up, right? Those are the ones people remember. So it's always kind of funny when I bring up like, yeah, we met online first and we've been playing together for like. Four, actually, it's four and a half years now, um, oh. and people just wind up shocked, like, "Oh my god, how did you do it?" And it's like, "Well, first off, we all got along really well, and second off, we communicate and you know just keep open lines about what's going on for the group so that nothing goes awry." Well, no, nothing, go nothing goes awry except except for the things that will. 
namely, oh, yeah. namely the namely whatever plan the GM has. Oh, oh God. Uh, <laughs> yep. Because uh, I there's... had so many moments. Oh, like a, every there, there was a soup. There was a supers campaign I did. I did that was inspired by Common Rider years ago, and I asked everybody to to come up with some sort of crazy ass weapon. Um, one of them, one of the players, came up with a shield gun. Second encounter of the campaign, he ends up throwing the shield gun and calling it back to him like he's Captain Fucking America. And I love it. In the in the near decade since, I have n- I have refused to let him forget it. This when whenever he kicks up a shield, I always I always say, "Don't throw this one." <laughs> <laughs> eventually, he has. Eventually, he's like, "Are you are you ever gonna let that go?" No. Uh, for <laughs> us, the moment for that in our party is um, my friend was. <laughs> Uh, so my timeline for like player to GM to designer pipeline, I guess we'll get into with this story. So started out as a player. The first campaign we played in kind of fell apart just because, you know, group growing pains and still figuring things out. Mm-hmm. The second campaign we played together was one that I ran. And in that campaign, my friend was playing a fighter and he um, he made the very, very poor decision of uh, waterboarding a assassin in a sacred pool that was dedicated to the goddess of death. But she was dedicated to, like, the moment of death and that being sacred. So he violated basically her tenants using her own hollowed ground. <laughs> And so from that point forward, uh, we remember that as the moment that he had a door and a window and decided to Kool-Aid man through the wall of the campaign (laughs) in in terms of decisions. Um, And he's somewhat notorious for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you you guys call him Kool-Aid man or something? No, no, no. We just never let him forget that moment whenever he talks about how he's a good decision maker as a player. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Because that changed the trajectory of his character for the whole campaign, because suddenly um, he owed it debt to death. It was a whole thing. Um, And then the other time I've had that happen was actually like not even in the campaign, but it was during like character creation and backstory creation for a campaign where a player looked at me and said, hey, could I be a reincarnated character? And I was like, Yes, but you realize this is going to have to make me go rewrite the cosmology to include how freaking uh, reincarnation works in this setting, right? And he's like, oh, sorry about that. I can change it if you want. I'm like, nope, you've already given me ideas. Too late. <sighs> but yeah, that was fun. Words of the wise, folks. If you want to bri- if you want to bribe the GM, bring him, bring him or her food. Yeah, that's kind of hard to do when you're spread across three different countries go go is could always uh, mail mail someone one of those one of those boxes of one of those random boxes of snacks yeah you could uh, those are always there's always like some hits in those boxes yeah one one of the gms who helped, te- helped teach me had a had a had a unwritten rule that um newcomer always newcomer always has to bring him a sandwich <laughs> um, nice most people, most people were doing PB and J or something like that. I decided to go the extra mile and make him a Reuben, objectively the greatest sandwich of all time. Fair enough. Um, I, fi- I figure, I figure he, I figure he had gotten the standard stuff. So I mean, so I'd have to step things up. But now on the on my particular channel i'm no stranger to rpgs using car- using cards instead of dice um the earliest one that i covered was dragonlance 5th age since that along with the marvel adventure game from tsr used the so- used the saga system that had its that was was and wasn't akin to a playing card deck 
And oh, that's fun. There and there's been the myriad of games through Saga Machine, who who I've had with who I have had on the temple games like Against the Dark Yogi, Dime Adventures, Age of Ambition, and Shadows Over Soul. Um, and the and um, Mitch, the guy behind Necrobiotic, has visited the temple and and found wa- and found ways to pr- to press my buttons with his bad sense of humor. <laughs> so I'm curious if I'm curious what aside I know that in the core book you had mentioned um overhead cost as one of the, as one of the reasons since it's easier to get a deck of cards. Um mm-hmm. but what turned what turned you on to the idea of using car, of using cards instead of dice? Uh, truthfully, uh, this was originally a dice pool system, so I have an entirely separate version of Ether that has not seen the light of day. That was a dice pool game. Mm -hmm. And that was because I hit a wall with regards to two things with the core resolution. One, um, the math was getting weird with the dice pool system. And two, I found that I had an idea in my head for wanting to bank successes and being able to manipulate odds of success. And I couldn't do it cleanly with the dice system in the way that it was built. Mm -hmm. So eventually in Ether's development, I kind of hit a wall where I just couldn't fix those two problems and I couldn't finish the game without solving those problems because there were things that were just really sticking for me. And so I decided to do, you know, this little one pager. I was going to do like a a dueling one page TTRPG about um, basically a trick taking system using the different suits. And Mm -hmm. so I start developing the trick taking system for that. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, shit, this solves all of the problems I was having with my dice pool system in Ether. Mm -hmm. Time to go redesign this game from the ground up, I guess. Uh, So I very much in the style of rebuilding a car engine, I rebuilt Ether as a card game. And then later on, about eh, maybe a year, eight months to a year later, I read the Lumen SRD by Gila RPGs, which basically was a very trimmed down dice pool system. It was using D6s. It had one to two was a failure. Two to three was a like a partial success. And, or one to two was a failure. Three to four was a partial success. Five to six was a success kind of idea. And I read that and I'm like, and I read how well it was doing combat and then had a couple other ideas I really liked. And I was like, well, this is solving the issues I was having with you know, combat bogging down and the math of the game. So I once again ripped the engine out, kept the card system, but tweaked it so that instead of doing a lot of like opposed math and having to do a lot of addition, it was just a strict um, fail, partial success, full success system and making it a lot simpler because my goal for the game was to kind of make the game get out of its own way. Um, I wanted I wanted skill checks and I wanted the active playing cards to be quick and simple. And I wanted to make sure that it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be a prerequisite for doing things in the game. I wanted players to do things and only need the cards to figure out what happens after they do things. Mm-hmm. I will I will admit when I saw the that rule of three resolution set up, the thing I was instantly reminded of was powered by the apocalypse. And I'm probably not the first person to bring that up to you. No, and it was actually a, a very prominent um I guess idea to pull from because the nice thing that PBTA does in regards to using terms like success and partial success, I think is it really, those terms are very common. So Mm -hmm. players are, can see them and sort of know exactly what they mean if they've played other TTRPGs, um, especially if they've played PBTA games or if players haven't encountered those terms before, it gets very quick and easy to grasp what those terms mean. 
Mm-hmm. So that was sort of me looking at them and saying, all right, time to grab a bit of the common like lexicon of TTRPGs and make it work. Because it it did what I wanted it to do. Mm-hmm. Now with that with that with that in mind, when it came to when you meant when you mentioned the whole the whole thing of considering banking effects, um Something that instantly came to mind is the what is the die pool setup that Weapons of the Gods slash Weapon slash um, Legends of the Wulin has in its game. Uh, I with, have not heard of that one. Um, both ga- Legends of the Wulin is basically the successor to Weapons of the Gods. Um, it's a case of do- of doing. Doing a refined version of the system, just without the just without the IP stuff. Ah, uh, makes Cause, sense. Because Weapons of the Gods is a um, is a manhwa that's run that's run for a bit of time. Oh, um, gotcha. But it is it is a D10 based die pool. Originally, it, originally it was um, it was attribute plus skill num- number of D10s. Mm-hmm. But instead of trying to roll high or roll low or roll for, or roll for a sum, the way it ends up working is, I, I describe it as I describe it as a Yahtzee like roll, um, where you where um you're trying you're trying to roll high groups because the tens is the number of is a number of is the matching number of matching number in the set and the ones is the Face value on is the face value on that set. So oh, if you that's roll, an interesting way to you do roll that. three sixes, then your roll then your roll is thirty six. Where 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 it's relevant to the whole banking thing is a mechanic it refers to as river. The idea being depend depending on how far, how far developed you are, you have one you have one to five um, slots for banking dice that you're not using for a given roll. So if you get if you've got a if you rolled thirty six but you had one nine but it's not worth it to to say that you had a roll of nineteen, um, you can put that die in the river, and th- and then swap and then swap it out for a die you might roll later. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, th- that is very similar to the the card bank I used in Ether, where it's. Mm-hmm. Um, your primary option and reason to bank cards is saving them for later. Mm-hmm. But there are other things you can do with them where instead of spending a, uh, a potential, which is your core player resource, to just take a card from your bank and use that to determine your success instead of, you know, risking failure on a skill check, you can also, without spending any resources, just remove a card from your bank entirely mm-hmm. and use that to apply status effects to a skill check or an attack or, um, you know, just sort of expand your abilities a bit more. It's Mm -hmm. also a fun thing where a lot of the sample player abilities play with the card bank too, especially stuff that gets into like really stacking odds or trying to be a support character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the kind of idea where it's like you'll pre stack or preload your card bank at the beginning of a session with two or three cards or however many, and then later on, you'll be able to spend potential to swap your cards in for other players' skill checks if you want to, um, to be beneficial, or to debuff opponents. You can swap in uh, as, you know, say you bank a two rather than a king. It's worthwhile to bank some lower cards if you have debuff effects, because mm-hmm. you can just say, all right, I'm turning your partial success into a failure, or I'm turning your success into a partial and that sort of thing. Um, so very similar concepts. Uh, and now you're you're starting to get me into talking about like the resolution, what I call the mm-hmm. resolution loop, and how it sort of is a very simple core mechanic that everything else in the game sort of spirals out from and stacks on and layers on top of it. Um, and what I think is sort of a a major feature of Ether's design is that like you have the core resolution which is basically you look at your character skill you look at the skills level the level tells you how many cards you play Mm -hmm. you play those cards and then you pick which card determines your success 
So you can pick the highest card and just go for it. But things happen based on, you know, which one you pick. If you pick, if you pick a success, you don't get any extra stuff. You just succeed on what you're doing. If you get a partial success, you can just bank a card for free instead of spending points to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the natural results of a partial success with sort of negotiating what happens. And then if you fail, you actually get a point of potential. So that's your yeah. way of regenerating. And so yeah. suddenly you have resource management coming in off the core resolution. You also have all the combat tricks. You have the skill resolution. You have abilities that are based off of potential costs and all this stuff that all just sort of spirals out from that one little engine of playing cards. And I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it so much. Now, speaking of speaking of that, for what it's worth, when when it comes to the failure, partial successful success, the the way I've the way I've always um, taught people how, how to interpret it is is respectively no and yes but and yes or, ra or rather yes and precisely yeah um, that that was the exact terms I had in mind when I built the system so and I'm guessing that potential is the game's equivalent to an extra effort system. Or an extra effort um, pool because you look around, effort, you look around enough, and you'll see a lot of games that that will ha that will have that kind of thing. Exactly, it's it's my way. Um, I referred to them yesterday in a Q and A as rule of cool points. So mm -hmm. it's this thing of potential. You know, every player gets it. They get a certain amount at the start of each session. Um, the amount they're getting might actually get lowered a little bit because right now they get a lot. Um, but it's because those points are there to for those moments whenever a player goes, okay, I want to do this thing, but I don't quite know if this fits for what the skill says, like in its description. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, the narrator, the game runner, gets to say, all right, yeah, it's a little bit like unorthodox, or maybe there's not a rule dictating whether you can or can't do this. So, you know, spend one, spend two, spend three, and we'll just let it happen. Um, so it's that, and then it's got some more specific uses because, you know, you need a few specific mechanical uses for that kind of resource just to give guidance on what it's good for, for new players. But then once players get more comfortable with it, you wind up in a scenario of like almost this bargaining scenario between the narrator and the players that I really like, especially like in personal experience from, uh, running a home game in the system. I found it's really fun to look at players and have them go, hey, is it all right if I do this and be really unsure of it? And I'm just like, yeah, sure. Just spend two points. Let's do it and see what happens. And I'm get. have you had a situation rega regarding potential use where somebody's gone Nova? Uh, yes. And it's always been amazing. <laughs> Um, so the game I run right now is an ongoing gothic horror campaign, which actually sits outside the realm of what I say Ether is really good for, which is, you know, playing heroic fantasy. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I wanted to do gothic horror is because all of my players at that point were on a big Witcher kick. So I was like, all right, let, let me tailor this to what your current interests are. And it was my interests as well, because I was also on that kick and we were all just enjoying that serious as it was happening and so there was a moment where um i had i had basically like these silver trees that were growing by absorbing people's blood mm -hmm. and one of the players uh his character flavor wise has blood magic but also has a malady that makes it go out of control and so at one point he asked me, because there's a limit break mechanic in the game, mm -hmm. um, they were about to enter a combat around one of those trees, and he was like, hey, before we enter combat, can I just spend five points limit break and use my blood magic to destroy the tree? And, like, that was a big... That was a big thing. Like, that, that tree was a sapling, but it was going to do some stuff during the combat. But I was like, you know what? Because none of the enemies have noticed you yet and combat hasn't started, nothing's popped off. Sure, let's do it. We'll see how this goes. And so it 
it really drove home this mindset for me of Ether being a system where whether you say yes and or whether you say yes but or whether you say no is more it's it's tied to the cards but it's also a scenario of okay my job as game runner is not to say your thing doesn't work my job as game runner is to say your thing works but either has separate consequences or happens to cause things that you absolutely do not expect. <laughs> and so oh. it, it's th it's that kind of thing where like, oh, it's not that you're just not going to do anything in the sense of failure. It's that, okay, if you do something big, the world is going to do something big back. Yeah, I, um, I'm a big fan of giving my players very powerful but very unsafe weapons. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the past I, get, I gave... One one of the more infamous cases was the was um was the boom was the boom rod, which make which um if you think if you could, if you listen close you can probably hear some immature giggling in the distance as somebody yells phrasing, but it was basically an XP of the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Nice, nice. It, it deal, it deals it, it it would be something that would deal a lot that would deal a lot of damage but you're going to be sent flying on your ass after it fires because it's a sonic weapon that works both ways yep oh. see i don't always give out items like that or give out powers like that but my players will always take options like that which is why like ether is a system that started out being built for this home group that i run games for Mm -hmm. As most designers do, you know, you you design for what you know. And then as people started reading it and getting their hands on it and enjoying it, I started expanding it to, you know, more and more people until I put it on sale. Mm -hmm. And so that pick your poison element is heavily, heavily present in game. And. I will admit that when I when I saw the when I saw the way omens were written out, one of the first things that came to mind of, of all things was um, exalted. Has anyone brought that? Has anyone brought that up to you, or or am I, I the exception? No, I have had a few people bring it up, and it's really funny because people are like, "Yeah, did you like read exalted? Did you read this game before designing? Because like it feels like all of these different things sort of fused together." And I was like. No, not really. I did. I didn't really read a whole lot of other systems before I designed this one. Most of my design process was, okay, what problems have I run into? You know, running things like D and D. What didn't I like? What did I really, really like? And just using that to expand and narrow the focus as needed. Really. I hope to God while running D and D, you never suffer the whatever whatever the die curse that Will Wheaton suffers. Uh, I haven't, but uh, in one of the few times where I created a weapon that was very powerful but had a damage drawback, one of my players always rolled maximum self-damage on a misfire without fail. Even when someone else was running her character, they still rolled maximum self-damage on a misfire. I'm pretty sure the words cursed dice were, were thrown around that day. Very much so. Uh -huh. Personally, I I don't believe in cursed dice because I believe I believe the die gods are a tr are are a true model of equality for all of us to aspire to. Because it does oh. not matter it does not matter your level of experience, your your height, weight, occupation, ge gender, pronouns, what ha what have you. The dice gods hate you, and they want you to suffer. I mean, yeah, that's accurate. But they hate. But they hate all of us equally. Thus, they are a model of equality. To the point where one of the mantras that I have in my temple is, "The dice gods show no mercy." Amen. Fair enough. But they seemed the only the only rule that that seems to happen when it comes to the dice gods screwing with people is really really loving making people get their comeuppance when they think that they have a certain role in the bag. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Like, 
anytime you say, ah, I'll be fine. You, you haven't had a one lately, have you? Oh. I think there, I think there was, there was, there was, there was, there was one instance where some, where somebody thought that they would, that because of how good they were at throwing javelins, they would try javelin snipe, they would try javelin sniping. <laughs> um, I love that concept. He had, he ended up he end, he ended up he ended up doing this set this long ass setup with all with a bunch of different abilities and spells. And he he makes his he makes his roll and it's a botch. Oh, and yeah. um one of the I he had learned a very le- he had learned a lesson that some that some of the people I know who who served have learned. The only thing more accurate than incoming enemy fire is incoming friendly fire. I've never heard that one, but it's really good. There's there's a there's a thing I have on the wall called the rules of combat that they don't teach you. And that that is one of them. Some of the other ones are things like never share a foxhole with anyone braver than you, tracer rounds go both ways, all five all five second grenade fuses are actually last 3 seconds. If you can't remember, the claymore is pointed toward you. And I'm pretty sure the reason that front toward enemy is written on claymores is because of some unfortunate Darwin Award moments. Oh, absolutely. Anything directional has Darwin Awards. Oh. Uh, of course, I of course my my use of claymores was was in any shoot in any shooter that I always played was always I was the asshole who would put them at the top of ladders. Oh, that's that is okay. I can't fault the tactics because <laughs> ladders are absolutely ideal choke points for claymores. I can fault poor sportsmanship because <laughs> um, that's just mean. Poor sportsmanship is playing Goldeneye and picking odd job. You know that that concept came pretty quick to mind. Are you sure you didn't do that? No, we had a we had a rule whoever of whoever did pick our job, everyone else would punch them in the dick. Mm. The idea the idea be, the idea being <laughs> being of course are you go, are you going to risk pain to to pick to pick odd to pick the one guy who everybody hates? Yeah, that's fair. Oh, that's fair. No one no one actually no one actually no one actually picked our job. I just figured. If I if I make a punishment that's ri- that's ridiculously heinous, everybody will be too scared to do it. Yeah, I mean, usually, but then sometimes there's always that one friend who's just like, you know what, risk it for the biscuit, just this one time, and then they learn. Yeah, the, there's but there's been there's been those there's been those kind of folks, although, um. I still, although th- then they then they end up learning the then they end up learning about the um about it. one of my favorite traps that I've used is both a player and, and a DM that I call the up button because way too many of my way too many of my trap ideas I I stole from watching Looney Tunes as a little kid. The up button is a rune trap when someone when someone steps on the square where it is they are treated as if they cast fly on themselves straight up for six seconds. Oh, oh no. So it is quite, it is quite literally an up button because you step on the thing, you go up. The moment of infamy for the thing was when in a, um, in a cave, in a cave lined with adamantite, a dragon who the party was fighting um, stepped on the thing when I was using it as a player. So they hit the ceiling, but it's adamantite. That doesn't move for anybody. Nope. But it did, but there were still five seconds left, and this is this is supposed to go at forty miles an hour. So oh boy. Um You ever seen you ever seen a car get in a compactor? Yep. That is what happened to that dragon because the spell says you go up, doesn't matter what's in the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, this reminds me of like some of the favorite times I've short circuited a GM. Um, 
And I say short, short circuited with all like love in my heart. So basically, uh, this was a D&D game. Mm-hmm. Um, and the GM had us get ambushed by uh, an assassin that serves a mind player. The assassin was statted basically using the Predator from Predator movies as a basis. So okay. it it had a legitimate chance to kill just about anybody in the party. Um, and, you know, we're all we're a party of like five players, all I think level eight at this point. So we're decently powerful and could hold our own against that kind of character when it was just him. So like him versus five of us alone was the fair fight, to put it in perspective. Um my character is a is a monk and a rune knight fighter, and I did not realize how important the rune knight element would become. But basically, uh, in the place we were fighting, it was under a a temple, and we were at the temple to collect water from an oasis that could actually cure people from being part of the mind flayer hive mind. Mm-hmm. And then it would, you know, permanently make them immune to being added to that hive mind afterwards. So in my infinite wisdom as a player, I and I I say that in jest because I just I made a Goliath monk whose whole thing was that he was originally a traveling blacksmith and he had just a bunch of odds and ends on his character and a lot of them were just like empty canteens and jars and potion vials. So I just like filled every empty container I had in my inventory with that water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because the GM specifically said we could take it with us and like give it to NPCs that we felt were important. And then this guy, this assassin walks in and we're fighting him. And thankfully, the fight happened after a break between sessions. So I had like a week to figure this out where basically my monk went through the process. It took me two rounds, but I went through the process of grappling and force feeding him a vial full of the water (laughs) (laughs) and it ended the fight outright because the GM, bless his heart, did not think of the way the water worked. And like I had asked clarifying questions, but he hadn't put two and two together. He didn't think of the way the water worked as a way to defang this guy as a threat. (laughs) But because suddenly he wasn't under control anymore, he had no reason to keep fighting. And he had been under control for centuries, so he was very out of it. But yeah, it was was one of those fun times of using a GM's lore against him. Mm -hmm. Um... And I love those moments, you know, part of part of the fun of designing either part of the fun of running games for me is when my players get to pull the wool over my eyes and, you know, vice versa. Because Mm -hmm. those moments like my home group is down for just about anything, but I always try to make sure that the twists I throw at them are fun rather than frustrating. And I think we all do that to some degree or another. Mm-hmm. Um, like in the most recent gothic horror game I just ran uh, the players found out that the gods of the country they're in are slowly wiping everybody's concept of like uh, recognizing the progression of time so basically the gods are taking these memories that aren't really like major or formative but they're removing people's concept of years so the country has no calendar If you say, like, people can say, oh, this happened 200 years ago, but people can't tell you, oh, this happened in 1955. 1955 does not exist in this country. Mm -hmm. Everything in history is just relative to each other. So now the players have had, like, a couple of days since that session where I've just been watching our group chat and, like, we've been chatting through it. And they've all been slowly becoming unhinged over it because it's, like... Okay, but if they can take this small of a thing, what else can they take from us? And what else are they hiding? And what about all the history we've learned so far? How long has this been going on? Like, it is such a small thing that has had campaign-wide implications. Mm -hmm. It's Uh, been fun. 
I I have um I have had I have had my fair my fair share of instances where where um instead sometimes sometimes I'll do things to make things interesting and sometimes I just feel like fucking with my players. Um I think one of the, I think one of the um ki- one of the one of the key instances of, of that was when I was was in a camp in a campaign where I was explaining that they would be doing a um they would be doing a ra- a rapid insertion method to get to get to the combat zone. What I didn't tell them was that the rapid ins- was that the rapid insertion method was via cannon fire. Oh joy. <laughs> oh. Or or the t- or the times where one where one of the N- one of the NPCs dis- when it, or actually this wasn't an NPC this was one of the players they um, they needed to get across one of the people needed to get across a cliff but there but there wasn't a there wasn't a rope nobody had any spells that could help so the Goliath in the party just set, just says you want says I I can help like what what do you mean you don't have a rope I didn't say anything about a rope. Um, I'd like to remind you that this, that according to Urban Dictionary, October is National Throw Short People Day. Oh gosh! <laughs> oh yeah, oh, picked, no. picked them up and just and just tossed them. Please tell me they at least succeeded on the roll. Well, they 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 succeeded, um, but it was a success with complications. So he ended up he ended up wall, he ended up um, wall planting. Oof. I mean that's still better than just missing entirely. Well, yeah, wall planting and then doing a tumbling, and he and he just a player decided to play along, play along by just, by doing the owl roll and then get then getting up and going, dude, what the hell? Nice, nice. Oh. Um, but yeah, but, uh, yeah, I love fun stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, Ether's whole design revolves around the idea of just let's push for the drama. Let's push for the thing that is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the mechanics, it, it's kind of, I enjoy it. I know it's not going to be for everyone, but I love the fact that you could literally play an Ether campaign and not even touch half the mechanics in the book. If you didn't want to, and if it didn't suit your play style, it's it's very modular that way because everything revolves around skill levels. Um, like all the math in the game is derived from your skill level of, of whatever skill you're using for a check, um, or you know, for your player abilities. Sometimes they'll be derived from how much potential you spent on them, um, which makes the math really simple and really clear. But like. If you don't want to use the crafting rules, you can ignore them. If you don't want to use the uh, special effects rules, you can ignore them. It's you don't lose any function in the game by ignoring the customization mechanics and the stuff Mm -hmm. that lets you tweak the game to your experience. The only time you would lose any kind of you know, experience of the game is if you started ignoring things like the omen system, where those are big kind of driving forces for characters. I'm just glad to see the fact that not only magic it not not only have magic as a skill, something I've been I've been I've been put I've been pushing for for the longest time and enjoy, and enjoy when it's used, but also um Look, I'm I'm not going to beat around the bush. I fucking hate Vancey and spell casting. <laughs> I hated it when I start when I started getting into tabletop and I still hate it. I, it has its time and its place, I will say, but I also agree. Uh, like, it, it's one of those things where, like, I don't hate it in games like D&D or in games like Pathfinder because in those games, I often see them as trying to make rules to cover every eventuality. So when a fantasy and magic system comes up, I know that a lot of the spells and a lot of the things are basically gamified responses to okay a player wants to do a thing we need to make rules for it whereas Um, when i was making this system my idea was okay player knows they could do a thing just let them do the thing mm -hmm. worry about the rules later do the thing plus 
Well, the, well, it's funny. You, it's funny you mentioned it being it being fine in D anD D because even in D anD D or Pathfinder, I still don't like it. Um, which is fair. It's just I I think it works within that system. Um, like regardless of taste, there is a function there. Um, it's not like bad design by any means. It's just a design that naturally lends itself to trying to codify every little thing. I I don't consider it bad design. I consider it vestigial. Yeah, I can understand that. Oh, but but um, you tr- but you try you try and apply that's that sort of lim- that sort of limited casting to certain cer- to certain settings, and it just falls right on its face. Like, oh, um, and it's and I've seen that I've I've had that kind of issue in the past where there's this assumption that you can use D and D or Pathfinder to run just about any campaign, but. A question that I often ask is, so I get I got a bunch I have of a few of my players have have um have a kenjutsu background, and because of that I've le- I've leaned into I've leaned into samurai style campaigns, and I've mentioned Legend of the Five Rings is one of my favorite um, RPGs of all time. Mm-hmm. The most common way to equip a character in D anD D is sword and board. How are you going to do that in a, in a culture where shields are not a thing? It it becomes a conundrum. Like that's the thing is, I you probably picked up on this reading ether as well. Ether is very very flavor and setting light. It is mm-hmm. almost like setting zero, flavor zero, and, and- there's a very specific reason for that and it's because in my opinion the having pre-existing lore in a rule book narrows or pigeonholes the kinds of games that that rule set will be good at running um and that's why i state openly in ether's rules that hey this is not a setting book this is not a lore book this is strictly rules with the intent of being able to do heroic fantasy best, but being able to run other types of fantasy decently well as well, in my opinion. I could probably I could probably use this to do something space opera vis-a-vis Mass Effect, and all I'd have to do is just um, futz around with a with the with the skill list, and half the work's done for me. Um, exactly. You know, it's it is built to be a flexible system, but in order to be that flexible. You sort of have to yank out some of the tent poles that you might expect to see in a game that also has lore attached to it. Yeah. Now, when it comes when it comes to the lore question, my attitude has always been not to put too fine a point on it, but shit or get off the pot. Yeah, it's like <laughs> go all in or don't put any at all. Like, um, I, br- make- I bring I bring up a, I brought up L five R earlier. You L five R knows exactly knows exactly what it's trying to do. It is try- it has a world that it's trying to do, that being Rokugan, and a playstyle that leans more into um more into political intrigue than murder hobo style combat. And everything everything that the game does is in service to that. Mm-hmm. That whereas something that's a bit more freeform, yeah, there, there's certainly some leanings towards towards um, heroic fantasy but it is but it's in but it's in service to a to a broad approach instead instead yeah. of something that specific that whereas when I, whenever i the question that i've the question that i've always asked with people whenever they say that you can run anything with D is what kind of fantasy is D and is because it because um it because when you look at the as much as I would like to say that you can do any kind of fantasy when you look at the specific classes the specific spells and and whatnot it kind of undercuts that and this is not a new problem this has been a problem for decades yeah like it, and we could go back and forth on the debate for that for a while I think you and I are pretty much on the same page though and it's just that thing of like. D and D was designed with a specific audience in mind, but now that audience has gone far beyond 
what the initial intent was. And so they're trying to open up to other audiences, but the design isn't keeping up, in my opinion. Um, mm. You know, when reason. it comes to... It's the reason why the best D&D experience is outside of it. <laughs> yeah, accurate. Um and that's, you know, part of what drove me to design either. I mentioned earlier that, like, I was running into the invisible barriers of the game because it just wasn't quite, it, it wasn't a matter of it, like, not supporting what I wanted it to do. There was a point where it started actively countering what I wanted to do mm -hmm. because there were so many moments where I'd have a player go, oh, I want to do this thing and then talk themselves out of it because the rules said no. And that was like the driving mental image, like the disappointed look on my players' faces when they realized that their cool idea just wouldn't work rules wise was the driving force behind a lot of this game. Mm -hmm. um, that's why, you know, the skill system includes magic as a skill because like I'm also I have ADHD. I'm also a low energy person, so I wanted it to be easy to learn. I wanted you to only have one system to learn for your skill checks and your magic, your combat and your other encounters. Like, I wanted it all to just be, you can look at one number on your page and know everything you need to know in order to make an action happen. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to make sure that like, it lended itself and was general enough to say, okay, go into this with a theme and lean into that theme for yourself, your play style, your character, however you want to do it, and suddenly the game will work for you. If you go into it trying to min-max it without some kind of idea of how to tie all that min-maxing together, the game just won't be quite as satisfying to you. Truth be told, and, with with um, with the way I have people um, um, set up set up their characters. I don't even have. I asked. I asked them to give me an elevator pitch first before I before we even break out the sheets. In fact, in some cases, I will withhold the. I will withhold the sheets, and I just say, I'll just go around saying, "Elevator pitch, go." And and like I've known some people that do that. I've known some people that just run very number heavy and mechanics heavy games, so the min maxing is encouraged. And like you can do that with a third like. Two of my players in my gothic horror game, we joke that they're damn near impossible to kill right now. But that's also because killing them is never the goal. Horrifying them is the goal. Right? So if they are difficult to, you know, take down in combat, that's fine. I'll just hit them with other consequences elsewhere because the system lets me do that. Mm -hmm. um, but the system is very much built for people who want to lean into decision making who want to lean into that element of like this is my character this is our story like yes it's going to lean into a little bit of that main character mentality but like it's built for that it's built to say like you all are dealing with these issues and the plot points you come up with as your omens are going to happen these are inevitabilities mm -hmm. how you handle them is where the story happens yeah you know, these are these omens are tent poles for the GM to plan around and to thread your characters together very nicely and have everybody participate in like the building aspect of the game. But those are the big like cornerstone moments and the story is going to happen between them or as a result of them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very much it's a story gamers fantasy RPG. Is it, that's what it is. I'm not going to shy away from that. So it's mm -hmm. not going to be for everybody. Um, no, I'm not. Tweeted out, I even nope. tweeted out earlier today that like it's not intended to replace a D&D &D or a Pathfinder experience. It's just meant to give you a different option if you're running into issues with those systems. Yeah. Um, I've, champ I've championed for the longest time that that not every game is going to be for everybody and how when i do mm -hmm. my my do the reviews that i do on my, on this channel um instead of focusing on how on how good or bad a given game is because obviously that's subjective the focus is on who i would recommend it to and how many caveats there would be in that 
sometimes 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 there are and some and sometimes that sometimes it's particularly easy to recommend something oh um, exactly now when i was go when i was going through the, when i was going through the thing aside from aside from the character sheet unless i missed something i didn't see as much i saw a lot of emphasis placed on the value of cards but not necessarily the suits um is there any th- is there any factor where the suits come into play or would it be a or would it be a tie- a tiebreaker setup like how savage worlds uses uses suits uh, neither, actually. That was one of the things I pulled out of this latest version of the game because, again, it was, it was. I don't want to say it was slowing down play, but it was adding a certain amount of busy work for players and for GMs to keep track of consistently enough that it was bugging me. So <laughs> the suits don't really matter unless you're talking your card bank, in which case you can only have one card of a suit, you know, um, you can only have like one three of spades banked, but you could have a three of spades and a three of diamonds banked and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, suits will sometimes matter for, you know, if you come up with certain abilities that say like, hey, gain one potential if you play a pair of threes during a skill check, etc. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so for player abilities, suits can work. Um, in various ways, but they aren't a core mechanic by any means. They're very much one of those sort of bolt-in systems that players can mess with. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I I say it partially because obviously there's the re, there's the red or black s- setup for those who want to do a fifty fifty shot. Oh yeah, and those are so much fun. I have never seen players dread something so much as when I call for a random red or black check and they can't figure out what they did to warrant me asking them for one Mm -hmm. it's the it's the most fun i've had in a long time and according to my players it's a lot of fun they have too yeah hell i had a player at one point like i asked him a question uh, related to some role play stuff and he looked at me like i was the gm he was the player and he looked at me and asked me to do a red or black check Mm mm-hmm and it, was, it was a big table flip of a moment because I was like, I, okay, let's do this. And it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But um, what would you say have been some of the big takeaways as far as what you've learned throughout the testing of the game? Um, ooh, that's a good question. So there have been a couple different modes of testing. I went through a lot of versions just through my own, like, downtime, revision, and editing. Um, But the major sort of playtesting moments have been this campaign I'm running for my home game, which is because it's a longer running campaign, it's been nice to sort of use it to fine tune certain things that I didn't get to fine tune with shorter sessions or whatnot. But I ran a live stream playtest where I, you know, altered the core resolution in the middle of that playtest. And I think the biggest thing I've learned through my playtesting is that a lot of things are just going to work and that's going to be fine and that's not something to be scared of. But you also have to be willing to look at the game and say, okay, these things saw a lot of action in play. These things didn't work out. And sort of, you know, taking good notes on what was and wasn't feeling good and just going going in the direction the game seems to want to go and be good at is what's important. Um, I said a line yesterday during a QA and a that I think was pretty uh, a pretty good summary of my attitude is that at some point you have to put your audience and your intended audience ahead of your own preference. Because at mm-hmm. some point your preference is going to lead you astray in your design where you're going to want to put a thing into your game that isn't what the game is conducive to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've seen that happen a lot. And usually it's those small vestigial rules that, like, made it through playtesting or whatever because people couldn't really come up with a good enough reason to get rid of them, but they also just don't work quite as well um, as they probably could. Like, my my big example is encumbrance. You know, <laughs> encumbrance in encumbrance in games that are not survival-focused games is 
almost utterly useless. I think but there's only a, two games in the last few years that I played where I actively used encumbrance. Um, right. Those were the black hack and um, this one and I forget. I forget what I forget what the name was, but it's one of the games that's in the family that's in the family of the Burning Wheel series. Which makes sense. Those both have, you know, very like OSR roots and encumbrance is a rule set that, you know, very much carries over from, you know, the o the OSR area of game design. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a thing where it's like okay, I get that you're putting this encumbrance rule here because it feels like it should go here, but it's breaking the theme of your game. It's breaking the intention of your game as you've written it. And so maybe you want to yank that out. It feels weird to say, but you mm -hmm. want to yank it out. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's that idea of like, all right, think of it like building a clock. But you put in a couple extra gears that are actually slowing down the whole process. Mm -hmm. Still works. It's just not working as well as it could. So you got to pull out the stuff that's, you know, actually working against you, even though it may not feel like sound design at first. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but so far, my playtesting has taught me that, like, sometimes your preference is not correct for your game design, and that's okay. You just take the thing you prefer and you save it for another game. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, I'm certainly going to be looking forward to how Aether develops, and I've I have my I have my own ideas since some of the character stuff that I've that I've done for my for my own writing doesn't doesn't quite fit a good a good amount of games, or the or the ones that it would fit would require me to get to break out the graphing calculator, and um, I've already paid I've already done my time play, playing GURPS. I don't feel like breaking out the calculator again. I, I feel that, and well, I could I could break it. I could break out the original version of Rifts, except I'd re except I'd rather not because I don't want to deal with twelve pages of house rules because somebody doesn't know formatting. Also a mood, yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I, I guess I I guess I would say Ether is the game that is like intended to be able to run characters and run stories that you would usually find in like mm -hmm. a GURPS or um, a Rift scenario, but without a lot of the extras that just bogged the systems down. Well, um, the main, well, you have one leg up on GURPS in the fact that you have actual formatting and navigation because um, <laughs> an easy, an easy way to piss me off when it comes to game books, no index or no, oh, yeah. or no, um, no index or no bookmarks or anything like that. Yep. That's oh. a mood. And like either doesn't have an index, but that's why I spent like four hours, like making sure my bookmarks were set. In that yeah. PDF. Bookmarks and hyperlinks. You get a pass. Yeah. Cause like, I think people underestimate like indexes are hard to build if you don't know how to do them already. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, I looked into the concept of making an index and I was like, Okay, this is going to be like an extra, you know, long learning curve for me. So I'm going to, you know, bookmark and hyperlink the hell of it because I already know how to do that. And then I'll save indexing for later. Mm -hmm. But that was that was kind of that process. Yeah. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, no, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I know we had quite a few wanderings, but it's always nice to sit down and talk shop. Well, wanderings is par for the course here in the temple. Uh, it's the reason I don't get on some of my colleagues when they when they end up wandering off, especially um, the eternally late Doku. That is fair. That is fair. But... Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to further discuss Aether or to talk shop or to let or to laugh at how snake bitten the ranger class is, <laughs> the door is always open. Oh, don't get me started on rangers. <laughs> my, my favorite, favorite class that gets treated like the fantasy game stepchild. Oh, 
But as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!